So, um, yeah, I'm Joseph Price, as Mike said. Uh, Andy and I are going to kind of tag team and go back and forth, and if we can't figure out who's responsible for a particular slide, um, we'll put forth some sort of scientific measure to determine who takes it, like rock, paper, scissors or something. So, um, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank SANS for having us back this year. Last year, we had a demonstration where we showed a mock-up of a number of, of components of a nuclear plant, just uh, items that were someone to try to attack um, a nuclear plant in or, or through cyber, that these are the types of things they would have to defeat, a multivariate attack uh, method. And that was well received, but we thought we would try for this year something that showed means of mitigations to these attacks. And what better example than uh, the Ukraine 2015 event um, in terms of looking at a, a, a multi-pronged uh, attack to achieve a certain objective. Um, how many of you have noticed this is one of the darkest conferences that you've been at? When I, when I was sitting out there, I was making faces at Mike Asante. He couldn't see. Uh, and so when you're up here, I can't, we can't even hardly see you. So do what you will. Uh, you can't, Is you anyone can, out there? You can't help us. You can't hear us. I just hear, I hear voices and stuff. So um, I just want to uh, give credit. Mike did some intros, but also in addition to those he introduced, there's also two of our colleagues from Silence here. We were joking at uh, who actually run, run and build the demo. We were joking at lunch that uh, I think Art Conklin said that every demo requires a, a human sacrifice. And he talked about them having shirts like red shirts on the old Star Trek. Those guys never come back from the planet. <laughs> if all goes well, they'll get, to, they'll get to beam back up, right? All right, so that's, that's the team. Is uh, DOE, the EISAC. We got Bill Lawrence here. I may say a word uh, about them or about him in a second. And Idaho National Lab. About a year, year and a half ago, actually, before I do that part, let me do this part. This is not DEF CON. This is not Black Hat. Uh, the demo you're going to see once we stop talking, if we ever stop talking, is uh, in, not about some incredible new R&D uh, breakthrough, a new vulnerability, a new exploit uh, that's breaking news. This is a, a, a presentation and a demonstration about training, about the need for uh, getting our workforce more mature and making our workforce, our more mature workforce, larger. About a, a year and a half ago, I did an informal survey uh, on Twitter. And I asked people like Chris Sistrunk and Brian Proctor, who I think is here, and a handful of others, maybe Jamie Sample. Um, uh, how many, depending on where you draw the, the line in terms of skills and experience, how many OT security professionals, capable OT security professionals, are, are there out there in, in the world? And by the world, I meant uh, the United States and friends. And the, uh, the numbers that came back, again, super informal, but you know some of these people and what they're exposed to. Um, we're in the hundreds. And again, it depends on wh how, how severe we are in terms of saying who's really capable and can do good things and who's not quite there yet. But uh, we, we argued about whether it was closer to like 500 or maybe up closer to 1,000, but it was definitely in the hundreds at the time. And one thing uh, people like Joseph and myself and others see, but certainly at the Idaho National Lab, which is a center for OT security uh, uh, capability, is that uh, demand is massively outstripping supply, hugely outstripping supply. And we have uh, generals and admirals and uh, heads of government saying, we need more of these people now, and utility CEOs, et cetera. And you just can't pay your way into getting them. It's the uh, work of many years, uh, as those of you who've gone through those years know, and those of you who lead teams and are trying to grow teams know. It's a long time to get to that point. So again, this is all a, a preamble to say what you're about to see after a little bit more orientation on where it comes from is going to be a live demo that some and maybe many of you will have a chance of participating in hands-on when we get to it. Here goes my first attempt to change the slide. That was the most risky thing. So the, the uh, uh, overview of the direction we're going to go into, these acronyms are familiar to all of you, I'm sure, uh, Wadibit. Uh, I'm going to cover mainly Wadibit. Uh, Joseph's going to cover the vast majority of Hwibu. And uh, then we'll be passing over to the, the red shirt team and Tim for Smidit, and they're going to show you that part. And then if everything goes well and there's time and this thing doesn't crash and burn, we don't have a heart attack, you can ask some questions. Whew, okay. And the slides are turning. Take a breath. Yeah. All right, so the Wadibit part. Look at this, look at this thing. Uh, this device was creation of the gentleman on stage and Tim. Uh, we codename it Pac-Man at the Idaho lab. It follows on the heels generationally on another demo kit called Little Blinky, 
uh, both uh, from the Pac-Man Pac uh, universe. One thing you should know about it is, in addition to doing what it's, what it's going to do today for you um, and what it's going to do in the trainings that we're going to describe that are coming out around the country, it's also used to um, create inject, inject uh, artifacts to make the next version of Bill Lawrence's and Tim's GridX more realistic for the players. So this thing has many purposes. It's brought to you by the good graces of DOE and their largesse, as long as they have some largesse left. Um, and it's doing multiple jobs for, for our community, which is, a, which is all a good thing. All right. At different points, we've been uh, instructed to not say what this demo is about. And other times, we've been told that we could say what it's about. So if this was the point where we still couldn't say what it's about, I would just show you this map and go, there's a, there's a country. <laughs> and I would say, there's the, uh, basically the bulk, the equivalent of our bulk system in that country. You got your high voltage transmission, some interconnects. You've got uh, uh, the generation is described there down the right hand side, left hand side with uh, thermal plants, nuclear, a lot of nuclear reliance in this, in this country. And uh, that wasn't the target, bulk wasn't the target of this, uh, first, uh, this first attack, which went at distribution and went after distribution and utilities. The only real Ukrainian word that I've learned to semi-pronounce is Oblenergos. I've heard Joseph say with confidence some of the other names, which you might get to hear him say. Um, it's worth the price of admission. But that, that was the target of the, t the 2015 attack. 2016 attack is a little different. You'll hear a little bit about both of them. Now, uh, how many people, I won't even know, have seen the movie Lost in Translation? This slide is a little bit about that if you actually take the time to read it. But the general message that's not lost in the translation is that on December 23rd, back in 2015, and this is, I, I apologize for how repetitious this is for those of you who have really been immersed in it. Um, but also remember in these, these conferences, we never know who are the relatively new people, and we're trying to bring everybody up to a certain level. So uh, that was the, uh, the attack in question. Uh, it caused a blackout. It'll be described more by Joseph in a second. And uh, I had talked to Tim today about this word in here. I don't know if you can see it, telemechanics. Uh, telemechanics uh, were attacked, and telemechanics were turned off in order to bring the power back on. And in the three utilities that suffered the big hits, the telemechanics, uh, which essentially is the automation, uh, catch-all term, automation, SCADA, et cetera, anything you can use to do something remotely in this space uh, is still off at the three affected utilities. So they have lots of people, many more than any US utility would tolerate or allow to carry on its, uh, its books uh, out there manually touching things, moving things, throwing switches, et cetera. That was uh, one of the Oblinergos. A second one here with dear customers is saying uh, a very similar message, albeit a little bit garbled. There's some part on here that I, that I saw when I was reading it at lunch about they got repaid this led to a repayment of 80,000 different categories. Anybody want to comment on repayment? I don't know, I know what that means. Don't you, use Google Translate. <laughs> what that means. I, I don't think they paid them anything for the outage. I think in the United States, we're not robustly repaid for the outage time that we get. I don't think they would be either. So this, this, these events triggered the, the good thing about these events for, for a lot of people, except for the people that suffered them, and maybe over time for them too, is that it took abstract concepts that we always had to explain to our senior leadership in utilities and government uh, that, were, that were abstract, that we knew could happen but hadn't really happened yet, but we needed to make them aware of the risk, the, they've gotten to see the, the chickens coming uh, to roost. And so now you can see it's a proof of concept that really happened. Uh, teams went out in January uh, from, from US to, to help diagnose what happened. And then now I'm going to show you a couple things that happened that went into motion after that. People in this room, Marty's team too, uh, the EISAC issued this level two alert um, in February, uh, not too long after that, the ICS. So that was good for our sector, yeah, the electric and energy sector. And then the EI, sorry, ICS cert went into action um, and built uh, their own alert, which gets you a little bit more detail in some ways and also gives you the cross-sector goodness since many of these systems are uh, similar and similarly configured in other sectors. So you got that. Uh, both of these documents, and I'll go to this references products, uh, reference uh, a fantastic creation by SANS uh, called a duck, a defense use case numero cinco uh, that was for many people, certainly for me, uh, my, gave me the best understanding of what really went down. 
and it didn't, and it got you around issues of classification, things like that. So you could, whatever could, was in the duck was, was good for you, both in understanding what happened and what you might do to keep something similar to, uh, happening to you. Okay. At that point, I'm going to hand over to my trusted, esteemed colleague, Joseph Price. Thanks, Andy. Go, so <clears throat> um, I want to draw attention. Marty alluded to this both in his, his talk and his slides, that uh, the attack in Ukraine in 2015 was not a particularly um, sophisticated, from a technical standpoint, the exploits that were used were not particularly sophisticated. It was the coordination and the, um, the broad nature of, of the uh, actions that were taken across three different Oblin Ergos that caught everyone's attention, along with the actual impact. Um, because as you can see up there, 225,000 customer outages, and really that's 225,000 subscribers, meters, so it could very well, we would presume, be much larger than just a, a quarter million actual people who suffered from that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There were three utilities, but as Andy noted, it was at the distribution level. So it's interesting to take this slide and go to the next slide and compare that in December of 2016, you advancing the slides, um, in December of 2016, and we have limited reporting, um, limited open source reporting about what exactly happened, uh, but it was one transmission substation that was actually attacked in 2016 and didn't get a whole lot of press. So I don't know if that's just the Ukrainians weren't as willing to share information about that. Um, but uh, if you look at the impact, and Andy, if you can go back and forth to the other one. Let me test going back technology. Okay. So <clears throat> look at the load impact, 135 megawatts on the 2015 across three different distribution uh, entities with multiple substations involved. Next, 200 megawatt higher load impact with a single substation hit. And so this is an area that is very concerning, I know, to me, because I, I look at it and I say, well, somebody's using Ukraine as their playground to refine tactics, techniques, procedures. Um, this, is, uh, this is important. I'm not, and if, and if we think that, okay, this can be done with a lack of technical sophistication that we know exists today, what can a properly trained and patient and resourced adversary do? But uh, curving it back to the demo, the reason that we were asked to do this is that um, it was recognized there have been numerous um, training courses that, have, that are starting to pop up all over. I think just recently, was it in February, Marty, that you guys just had your 100th Red Blue? Last week. Last week, thank you. So um, Red Blue has been very popular. Um, we wanted to, we talked with DOE and we wanted to offer something that would be some, that would provide some hands-on training similar to uh, what you did in, in Red Blue, but with a different twist. First of all, a one-day course offered um, without cost to folks within the sector, and to actually look at not just this is what happened in Ukraine, but use that as a model to how would you mitigate these different uh, elements. I wanted to say something. Go for it. Okay, I'm gonna step here. I'll try not to upstage you. Okay. <laughs> I meant to say in my opening part, I was um, about to, to give recognition to Marty and the ICS cert for the completion of the 100th class, each of which is uh, approximately 40 people at a time. It happens in, in Idaho Falls. Uh, that, if you can do the math, that's uh, 40 times 100 is, I think they're claiming 4,000 is the roll up of that. That's a lot of people. And uh, the students, almost anybody can, can go into it skill level wise. You can be more of a business person. You can be a super techie on the IT side. You can be an OT engineer. Uh, and there's a, there's a role for you to play in the way they've constructed that exercise over the time. But, you, but our, our senior leaders can get fooled sometimes and think, wow, that's 4,000 people. Remember I said there's only hundreds, uh, depending where you draw the line. Those 4,000 people, and this is, I don't think Marty will take this as a, a slight, these people are not certified OT security experts. These people have all been exposed to the issue in a way they hadn't got before. It's now much more visceral for them. But it's like anything, when you try to become an expert in anything, the minute you start learning about it, the first thing you know is how much you don't know in a way that you never had any idea before. So we got 4,000 people walking around, and maybe some of them, I'm sure some of them have progressed and studied and gone to training and done hands-on experience, and now are part of the, the, the fleet of hundreds of really great people that we have. But a lot of them are, are messengers of this message uh, to pass around. Again, I wanted to give kudos to ICS for, for making that happen. SANS does something similar with ICS 410, which I did last year, uh, which ends up with a class full of 
on one side, its introduction to ICS security. And you end up with uh, half IT security people who, need, who want to get OT into the uh, operational system of them, and uh, half operational people, like a guy from Fermi running a nuke plant uh, that I sat next to last year. And they're both, again, see, see how you take this, they're both pissed off half the time because <laughs> Because the class is both security and operation stuff. So the IT security people, when they're getting introduced to basic cybersecurity concepts, they're like, yawn, 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 I paid a lot of money, what's this all about? And similarly, the operational guys, when the, when the class pivots, this is with Justin Sorrell, who's an outstanding teacher to operational stuff, uh, they're like, yeah, that's my world, why are we even talking about that? By definition, it's both of those things, and they take, that what really happens is the conversations they have with each other are the part that make it really worth having both of those groups in the room at the same time. That was just like 30 seconds, right? You can check. I think this is gonna go down, actually, as the... Uh, Mike Lack says otherwise. <laughs> it's gonna go down as the pick on Mike Asante conference. Um, so, if anyone else has any other criticism of the conference, Mike will be uh, ready to take it on the yellow card, so. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, DOE, along with EISAC and INL, um, are going to be putting together a series of hands-on uh, workshops. The first one is coming, um, of course that slide isn't there yet, so I'm going to jump ahead to it. Uh, the, the next workshop is actually coming to Salt Lake City area April 20th at the Western Electricity Coordinating Council. And we were hoping that link would actually be out here in time so we could put the link on here. It's not, so we're going to say watch, watch WEC, look for that link. It will be, I think we're hoping for Wednesday. And they the, can ask us to, to yep. we'll have it soon. Right, and so uh, what are we actually gonna do at the training? Again, like I said, it's gonna be, it's gonna be technical in nature. It's gonna be very hands-on. Um, everyone will have a sort of a miniaturized version of the demo kit that you see up here, and they'll be able to actually walk through these types of things, which were uh, elements of the Ukraine attack as well. Again, it was modeled after some of the techniques that were used by the adversary there, um, and showing, no kidding, what would you look for, what would be the effect that it would create, and how could you mitigate it uh, to begin with. You'll actually have your fingers on a keyboard. This isn't just gonna be listening to someone lecture. You will get to interactively work with uh, your own version of mini Pac-Man, um, or Pac-Man Jr., if you will, to, uh, to deploy things like, such as Ettercap, looking at man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, Metasploit is a framework to look at different exploits you can run. <clears throat> In addition, to the Salt Lake City one. We're looking at May as the time frame for a workshop on the East Coast. So I'll just tell everybody, keep an eye on the East Coast, okay? Look for it, no, I'm just kidding. There, uh, like the fires of Minas Tirith, this is gonna pop up. Um, we will make sure those links get out into uh, uh, our shared partner sites. Um, and we just recently heard DOE confirm they're gonna have a third workshop geared sp specifically towards oil and gas. So um, with that, we're gonna pivot over to Tim. We're gonna go into the show me the demo piece here. We're gonna follow the, or uh, preclude that with a couple of items. So first, just from a perspective to get everybody in, from our last year poster, we kind of introduced these topics on attacker objectives from causing a loss of view, loss of control, denial. The items that we're gonna focus the most on here is the manipulation side. So the manipulation of control, so misusing an operator workstation to control things in the field, um, and manipulation of view, so controlling things in the field directly without going through an operator workstation. Um, uh, also, a couple of things from a, a demo slide perspective. We're not talking about these items in the upper left. We're assuming we're at a point at the 12th conference that we understand people are targeting corporate networks, getting footholds in corporate networks, and misusing the trust from those networks down into the control server networks. Plenty of courses, plenty of online videos, plenty of tools to talk about that item. Um, we're gonna focus more in the workshops on the need for improved capabilities to identify when an adversary is in a control environment, defend against that environment, and share that information amongst your peers. Um, if you're still kind of in a place where we're talking about the old days of, you know, I have children, so I always try to lead my slides towards that. If you've ever played the, uh, this is the church, this is the steeple, open the doors and see all the people. I, I say we play cybersecurity in a lot of ways that, you know, you just do different hand motions, that there's bad guys out there, but they're way over there on the internet, and we put up firewalls so we're perfectly safe from it. So you do different hand motions, but you still get the same result. We play cybersecurity in a lot of ways, so we try to talk quickly through kind of how you get from corporate and get into a control environment. So from a stage one to a stage two attack. I've highlighted some of these areas here for you to think about. Trusted connections, vendor access, 
all the tools that you use for system management from patching, monitoring, alerting, they all have trusted communications into those environments in many cases, or data historians, uh, social engineering attacks, a lot of those other pieces. So I'm gonna ask you to just bear with us when we're assuming that through those discussions that Chris has gained a position on the engineering workstation. Um, either through a trusted communication, through a vendor access, through some type of remote support, he is on the vendor workstation. And with that, we are going to uh, begin. We're gonna start with the easiest of all items. Chris is going to go from the engineering workstation and he is going to connect directly to the operator HMI and manipulate the screens. We're also gonna try to do something interesting here. We have uh, command strip mounted a camera to this thing. So if you can go, uh, sure we have. I see it here, you don't see it. One second. And if you can pull up the other screen with Chris's on it. So one screen should be me and one should be him. Okay. There we go. Okay, so this is the kit. So Chris running uh, a few commands here, he's gonna go straight to this operator HMI. Uh, instead of having a full blown workstation, we've brought a operator panel here for uh, travel purposes. He's going to connect direct and simply operate the breakers direct. So carry on. The other piece too is as you're looking at this and the layout, we are going to be um, uh, using this in a couple of different critical infrastructure. So expand your mind in regards to what you're seeing on the screen, whether this could potentially be a, an HMI for a substation or at a generation facility or in a compressor station or somewhere out in the pipeline. The purpose here of what we're doing in one of these labs, so in this cyber workshop, we're gonna have about six labs and about six hours of content that uh, Mike and I will be going through. This initial one is to talk about from an operator perspective. They just saw something happen in their system. They saw a mouse moving, they saw breakers opening, they saw set point changes. So if you look back at the Ukraine, two utilities, that's what they saw. So they knew immediately they were under attack. They knew something wasn't right. Um, if you want to, uh, I'm gonna switch back. If you want to, you changed the set point already? Yes. Okay, um, send red and go okay. uh, out of manual. So he's gonna continue to do some things while I'm gonna continue to show some other slides. So very simply, engineering workstation straight to the operator HMI. Nothing major, but the piece is here to talk about when we're working with these electric sector personnel. If you're looking at your operator and saying, what should you learn from this? The operators, if you talk to them and say the electric system is failing, they have piles of procedures on what they're gonna do with that. The operators know what to do when the system is failing. When you're talking about the technology is failing, they talk about the OT group. They say, well, they have a plan for that. The OT groups have piles of procedures. When you start talking about somebody is misusing your control system, it's, I don't know what to do anymore. So at a very basic understanding level, when we see uh, something like this happening, like mouse movement, when we went over to the Ukraine, in at least two of the organizations where they saw the mouse movements, we were given or shown videos of that happening. So the operator seeing their mouse moving, they got their phone out, but instead of calling somebody for help, they made a video of their mouse moving and opened the breakers and going from substation to substation and substation. That's here in the States and every, wherever, wherever you come from, make sure your operators know when something starts happening, they know their workstation is being misused against them. At a bare minimum, if they shut down their workstation, the adversary will now have to find another one to misuse and control, or they'll have to go to attack step two, which we're gonna move into now. So from an attack step, step two perspective, we saw two utilities with the phantom mouse movement where the mouse was just moving and opening uh, breakers. When we move into this third step, there was a, a, uh, a third utility that they just saw the effect of what was happening in the field. So the adversary was sending commands direct to the field device. So the item out in the substation, the operator panel was still getting live status of what was happening, so they didn't know what was causing the outages in their territory. So I'm going to switch again, and if you want to send commands direct to the field. So no mouse movement anymore on the operator HMI, he's just sending straight out to the field to operate. And the operator HMI actually updated, so in this case the unit went offline because we opened all the breakers. But he didn't have to use the operator workstation, no mouse movement, so this would be the third utility in Ukraine that just saw the effect of what happened. If you wanna reset them all and go back to red. So from a attacker perspective, I don't know if his mic is on, and we should probably move this little kit so you can actually see uh, our, our adversary here. So the, the other piece that I'll make, or point that I'll make while this is moving, 
when we're doing these workshops, again, free through DOE, this is at the head end, and we're going to do a demonstration of each lab when we're doing them. The little mini kit is a smaller version of everything up here. Same logic, same toolkit, same everything that the participants are going to receive. There'll be uh, 10 of those sent throughout, so if we cap it at 100 participants, you'll be groups of 10 working through all these labs hands-on. So as a participant, you'll get all the tool sets, the VMs, and a kit to, uh, to work through. Um, so in order to do this, what did you have to do to first identify how you, so I'll, I'll go back to step one. When you got a foothold on the engineering workstation, what did you have to do? Did you have any special tools or technology to operate the operator HMI? Nothing really. Uh, basically, we just used MMAP to identify that the HMI was running a VNC server. Um, and we connected to that. There was no password, so that's why we were able to connect into it just in the screen came up. So there was no protection whatsoever. So understanding kind of at that very basic level, when somebody, if you think of at a corporate network environment, somebody getting a foothold in the environment, they have to scan that environment. They have to look for vulnerabilities. They have to find a vulnerability that now they're going to go and exploit within this space getting a foothold in the control system network is the vulnerability. Now, the tools and technology that are used by the operators, by the system support personnel that are enabled on these assets by default, he simply has to use them as they were designed, except he's misusing them in a way they were never intended. So remotely, he connected to this, operated it. For the second piece where he's sending straight to the field assets, what did you have to do in order to make that happen? Uh, basically, we just we used a uh, Python script uh, that knows how to communicate over SIP and we basically just wrote uh, tags. We just decided, determined what we wanted to write. So thinking of an adversary trying to achieve a predictable uh, outcome, if you simply sent tags out to the field device, you would have no idea what was going to happen. So how did you first identify what tags to send? Well, we'd assume on the engineering workstation, if we had compromised that, then we would have basically the schematics for how the, the controller was programmed, and we would, we would know those. Is there any way you could have observed or captured data? We, when we do a man-in-the-middle attack, shortly we'll be able to see all that. Awesome. All right. We somewhat rehearsed this. <laughs> all right. So for the second one, uh, what we just showed, the uh, engineering workstation straight to the field device. Um, items to consider here as we just kind of walked through from a defender perspective. What are you doing at a network detection level that you would actually detect there's commands going to field devices that aren't coming from operator HMIs? Are you looking at the traffic that's going out to your field devices? Are you controlling that in any way? Are you limiting it in any way that communications out to the field should only come from certain workstations? For part three, we're going to go to the engineering workstation again, and now he's going to open a connection into both. So he's going to man in the middle the operator workstation and continue to send it a, uh, a predictable signal as if it's coming from the field, and then he's going to operate the devices in the field. Let me rotate out. So uh, you will spoof everything to this as if it's all breaker closed. Okay. So right now, I'm um, just one thing to, to kind of show you. You're on the screen. Oh, I am? Okay, sorry. Uh, we have Wireshark up right now. I'm, I'm watching the traffic. But if I type in right now as a filter, I do SIP, uh, I will only see just a little bit. Um, that was from what we, we did uh, a few minutes ago with the changing the lights. But in general, I'm not seeing any SIP traffic going between the controller and the HMI. Um, that will change here shortly. Addercap is just basically a man in the middle uh, tool. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert myself as the attacker in between the HMI and the PLC. Um, I'm going to tell them both that I'm the other. Uh, so they'll send their traffic through me and I'll just route it between the two. So you're spoofing all red to the operator HMI? Not quite yet. I can't. Oh, here we go. Sorry, getting there. We had, uh, while he's doing this, Jason Dealey from Silence working with us on Logic last night. We were encountering some interesting things on these devices while we were testing this. So here is now we are, um, as you see, the Wireshark is now capturing all the SIP traffic. So that's all coming through my attacking machine at this point. Because you're performing the man-in-the-middle attack. Because I'm performing man-in-the-middle attack. Now I'm going to basically start spoofing uh, the light status uh, to the uh, HMI. And these are Python scripts. Uh, oh. This is actually an adder cap filter that I'll be okay. doing. Okay. So for the attendees, you'll be getting 
the VM, the editor cap preloaded, installed, the scripts to run, the mini kit that used to be up here um, at your table and walking through those. Okay. So right. now on the HMI. You're spoofing this all red? Yes. Good. Now I'm going to change uh, the lights to green. Yep, for sure. Note the operator uh, panel. So in this point, we did not see this in the Ukraine. We did not see an action where they combined attack method one or attack method two um, to actually fool the operator. They either used their tools against them and operated the devices in the field, or they uh, sent commands direct to the field and the operator displays were actually correct and accurate. In this case, uh, not so much. So if we wanted to try to manually operate this, um, you'll note because he's still in sending, I can't actually use the system at all. So at this point, if we wanted to get him out and we severed our remote connections, we had a way of kind of load shedding through a cyber means and disconnecting untr or trusted paths, remote access paths, um, and stop his connection in. So go ahead and kill your, uh, your spoof. And stop sending. We would need to move to a model where we reset. And come back to life before we can actually operate again the panel now that he's stopped his connection, which we could have done from a defender perspective by eliminating his remote access and eliminating his connection. I think we are approaching the end of time, but a couple of things, I just added this this morning because it came up, somebody asked a question about the 20 critical controls. We had talked about this a little bit in regards to if we had to prioritize these for ICS, I believe uh, it was mentioned um, that uh, kind of inventory, item one and item two and item three secure configurations they would likely stay with those three. The other three that when we worked on another presentation we pulled together is the limitation of control, network ports, perimeter defense, and incident response. I think those would be our kind of top six of items that we would look to in an environment that's looking to start somewhere and start making a difference. So with that, surprisingly, demos all worked well. Well done. Nice. And uh, we're going to go to Mike and the yellow cards and any questions you have. Mike and the yellow cards. Very good. Very good. While you thank ask you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get a round of applause for our folks here. While you ask questions, I'm going to close some of this for Stephen Hill. Good, yes, please do. You're going to start packing up your demonstration. You're multifaceted. Um, so a question from the, from the audience here. There was a huge difference between Ukraine 2015 and 2016 attack regarding the megawatts affected as, as described by Joseph here in terms of uh, the outcomes. And um, you missed that pun opportunity. Right? Step it up to transmission. Anyway, um, I'd like to use that personally. Um, but so one substation was affected. What indicators of compromise were observed in targeting of that one substation? It appears that attackers knew which substation to attack. So what evidence and TTPs were observed? That's a good question. If you're talking about the 2016 attack? Yes. Because there's, uh, there's very limited reporting on that. Um, uh, it was clear from just from the reporting that I looked at that uh, they targeted the energy management system um, and therefore could have a much broader, more sweeping right. effect. Um, the, the, uh, the, and that's actually, again, that's the area where we're really concerned because when you go up to the transmission level, we knew back in, I think, January of 2016 that, uh, that, that the transco might be at risk. Um, there was evidence that another Fishing camp, spear phishing campaign originated from the transmission company. But of course, everyone was dealing with the fire that was right in front of them and no one was worried about the glow, glow over the horizon. Um, and so uh, I actually wasn't that shocked whenever I found out that they had actually hit uh, a transmission substation because we were pretty sure that they were targeting the, that transmission company all along. Right. So in fact, the general manager of the Ucanergo said he believed that that substation was selected because it was the most automated substation in that portion of their system. And Ukraine has, particularly, they have eight regions. So this was the capital region right, within Kiev, Kiev uh, and did result in a very large outage as it related to the amount of people being served by that substation. For the 2016 event, while there's not a tremendous amount of public information, I would suggest on sans.org, there's a blog post that we wrote that talks about thinking about that event and the different attack vectors and how they could have performed it. So what was somewhat talked about, I believe, is if they'd conducted the same actions of mouse control, I believe some of the information or some of the discussions is that's not the same, but again, using kind of living off the land and using their tools and technology against them, 
getting a foothold in their environment and talking out direct through the front ends to the field devices um, would be one way of achieving it. Going from one substation up to a head end and down to other substations would be another way of performing it. And then just the communication networks in between. So we lay out kind of five attack vectors for that uh, 2016 attack. And we're still waiting for details from Ukraine. They were kind and gracious in 2015 to share, and so we're hoping that we also get the same level of sharing. Um, and I guess uh, only other point to make there would be that uh, it's, it's very possible that you just demonstrated one of the effects, which was probably an injection by sitting on a host somewhere in the control center network and sending the commands directly to that substation. So we probably just demonstrated how it was done. Uh, next question, was any of the attack performed uh, anything but open source software once inside the control system network? Was any of the attack performed? What we just did up here, everything was open source. Yep. Nothing was, not, not Skate Pack, not Gleg, we didn't buy any products, Canvas, nothing. It was all open source, all gonna be given away to the participants. Yep. For the HMI takeover in Ukraine, was there network security in place with SCADA on an isolated network? That'd be 2015, I guess, to answer that. Uh, the answer was there was security practices in place. There was segmentation. There was commercially available front-end uh, firewalls that separated the distribution utility from their internet connections. There was heavy use of VLAN segmentation throughout the enterprise, and the operational segments were on their own VLAN segment. Uh, and they did use endpoint security, so they had, they had uh, market-based endpoint security systems in play. But their weakness was the human, For as sure. usual. Once uh, they used spear phishing, they had code executing inside their uh, protected area, um, and it harvested passwords, and they were able to create their own accounts. And at that point, they're now just using the uh, capabilities and tools that were already built into the system for their remote operations and things like that. So Hence the yeah. need for more better educated humans. For the 2015, uh, black energy used to get a foothold, black energy used with that foothold to get credentials, escalate privileges, eventually get access through the VPN, and now they're part of the trusted communication path. No more need for black energy or custom malware. They lived off of all the tools and technology available. Right. To what extent could uh, basic network security measures such as DHCP snooping be used to mitigate the man in the middle vectors that you demonstrated here? There, for sure, there are a number of, you think of all the things that most are doing at their corporate level, the tools and technology are absolutely available and exist. It's just they're not typically present at the uh, control system levels. Very good. So when you take this show on the road, you're demonstrating the hijacking portion of the attack against the SCADA system by being able to open remotely controlled circuit breakers in the field. Will I be allowed to bring some tools and demonstrate the breaking aspect of the oh, attack? No. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. no. You won't let me take out this Alan Bradley in here? No. Ah. Oh, no. You, it won't hurt you, can, uh, you can bring whatever tools, but definitely uh, the rules of the game are don't damage okay. the hardware. Okay, so there will be rules of the game. <laughs> Okay, we're going to teach you a little bit how to take care of firmware stack later in the afternoon, but we don't want to do that in this demonstration there, kit. One of the labs that we go through in, uh, in the workshop is a firmware level lab where we start looking at uh, the firmware of one of the devices. We don't actually manipulate it or cause harm, Very good. but we get you right to the door. We get you right to the door and go no further. <laughs> yes.